the Job Accommodation Network Accommodation and Compliance Audio and Web Training Series. I'm Beth Boy, and I will be the moderator for today's program called Wearables Roundup, or Wearable Roundup, Wearables as Assistive Technology for Workplace Accommodation. This will be featuring Teresa Goddard, lead consultant for the sensory team, and Brittany Lambert, a consultant on the same team. But before we start the program, I want to go over just a few housekeeping items. First, if you have experienced technical difficulties during the webcast, please call us at 800-526-7234 for voice and hit button 5, or for TTY, call 877-781-9403. Second, we plan to answer as many of your questions as we can during the presentation. So please send in your questions at any time during the webcast. These can go to our email account, question at askjan.org, or you can use our question and answer pod located at the bottom of your screen. To use the pod, just type your question and then submit it to the question queue. Also at the bottom of your screen, you'll notice a file share pod that you can use if you have difficulty viewing the slides or would like to download them. And finally, I want to remind you that at the end of the webcast, an evaluation form will automatically pop up on your screen in another window if you don't have your pop-ups blocked. Now we really appreciate your feedback, so please log- stay logged on to fill out the evaluation form. We'll also send this form to you after the webcast when we send you the link for the recording. So I've been looking forward to this webcast. It's pretty timely, and Teresa and Brittany have put a lot of work into it. So let's go ahead and start today's program. Brittany? Thanks, Beth. Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's presentation. In this session, we're going to tell you all about wearables, what they are, what they can do, and how they may be beneficial parts of an accommodation plan. I want to briefly go over today's topic. We're going to explore wearable devices and how they may apply as workplace accommodation solutions. We're also going to review several situations in which wearables may be used to address common workplace limitations, such as time management, medical management, stress management, information access, and communication. We'll also spend a bit of time reviewing accommodation trends and take a look at wearables in development. We hope to address any questions that you may have on these topics as well. So what exactly is a wearable? Is it anything that can be worn or attached to the body? Let's explore this idea. A wearable device is defined as a monitoring modality that is worn by a user in daily life. It's usually integrated into items used daily, like watches, eyeglasses, rings, vests, gloves, belts, shirt, brassiere, shoes, necklace, and barrette, as an inseparable component. An individual customized size is usually required. It often moves with the user ubiquitously without any apparent or obtrusive parts. In addition to devices defined as wearables, we're also going to look at a few products that could be described as attachables. So what's the difference? An attachable device is defined as a monitoring modality that should be attached onto the body non-invasively or can be touched occasionally by a user intentionally. It is not a necessary item, but has an unnoticeable impact on daily life, such as a tattoo, pad, pedometer, mobile phone, tablet, and other portable devices. It's usually one size fits all. While these distinctions do exist, for the purpose of this webcast, we'll be using the term wearable as an umbrella term for both wearables and detachables. Anything that can be worn or attached to the body is fair game. Research suggests that the market for wearables is continually growing. 56.7 million adults are predicted to use a wearable device at least once a month in the year 2019. An additional 3.8 million children and teens will have such a device. Over 500 million wearable users were connected to a 4G network in 2017, while the market is expected to grow by 89 million by 2022, connecting over 9 million. 
With the steady increase in wearable usage, it's becoming more and more common for users to rely on their devices for things like symptom and medical management. This means employers may be seeing more wearables in the workplace, which may necessitate a conversation about reasonable accommodation. Wearables aren't just for leisure. They can be powerful pieces of assistive technology with practical uses in the workplace as well as home. Employees with disabilities may find the use of wearables instrumental in addressing the following needs. Productivity management, medical management, stress and symptom management, information access, and communication. So next I'd like to talk about smartwatches, one of the more common wearable and attachable devices that we hear about here at JAN. Um, the best thing about a smartwatch is also the worst thing. There are so many things that it can do, both work-related, health-related, uh, and also uh, for pleasure and relaxation. So what we find with smartwatches in the workplace is that while they provide convenient access to lots and lots of apps, including some that can be very useful at work, useful for monitoring our health, they can also be used as a distraction. We're going to get into that uh, in the coming slides, talking a little bit about how sometimes a smartwatch might be the best solution for someone, and sometimes you might want something else that lets them handle their issue in a different way. So on this slide, we have some of the more common smartwatches, the Apple Watch, which a lot of us are familiar with, uh, Android Wear and Samsung Gear, or other popular brands. Uh, but especially for those who use the Android phones, there are so many different options for smartwatches, and you could really be looking at a watch and not realize it's a smartwatch, wouldn't you agree? I would. Absolutely. Yeah. So like the, the Apple Watch is kind of iconic. You know you're looking at a smartwatch when you look at it. But some of the others might uh, be less obvious in the workplace, which could be a good or a bad thing, depending on your perspective. So... What we find is if somebody wants to use an app that works with the smartwatch or use reminders on the smartwatch itself as an accommodation, it's critical that they plan to use it in a way that makes it a help, not a distraction. Uh, so one thing that can be very helpful is if you modify the notifications that are coming to the watch. For some watches, however, they kind of uh, mirror how you have your notifications set up on your phone. So if you could go to the next slide, Beth, I want to talk about the dot for a second. The dot is a specialized type of smartwatch specifically for Braille users. Uh, and if you're uh, tuning in and looking at the picture, you can see um, small dots. And if you look very closely, you can see that some of them are raised and some are recessed. So this is actually a teeny, teeny, tiny Braille display on a watch the pairs with a phone so that you can get um, not only your time and date like you might with uh, many types of Braille watches, but also notifications, texts, and so on. Uh, and you read them just as you would any other Braille display, but of course it's very small. Uh, and that's one complaint that we have heard from people who have trialed this is that there's uh, so little Braille space there, it's hard to get a lot of usable info quickly. Now, the positive feedback that we've gotten about it is that it is so discreet. A lot of people who uh, are blind or have low vision who are using, for instance, the Apple Watch uh, are using that more or less in like a sound field mode so that people who are nearby might be able to hear what the watch is saying. For some people, they like that. They like that audible input. But for people who either prefer Braille input or need Braille input due to a hearing impairment uh, or who just want more privacy, the dot might be the way to go. So uh, right now, it's recently had a price drop. When we checked this, when we turned in our presentation, the current price was three ninety nine. Wow. But uh, as of today, you can get it for three twenty eight on Amazon. That's great. So it, it's really an amazing price for what you get. Yeah. Being that it's a customized Braille product, um, I don't know if, if you've ever looked uh, that into regular Braille watches, but just a regular Braille watch is, is a lot more expensive than something that you would buy off the shelf at your department store. Well, I think some of the smartwatches are around three hundred dollars too, aren't they? This is competitive in price to other smartwatches, yes. Makes sense. Huh. Yeah. So it's an exciting product. We hope we're gonna get more feedback about it. Great. But you know, it just depends on the user. 
And we have talked to people who actually use both in different situations. Okay. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about, oh, wait, this is Brittany's slide. Brittany, you stole my favorite example. <laughs> <laughs> now we're going to take a look at solutions for productivity management. Let's start with a practical example. A surgeon with attention deficit disorder was having difficulty getting to the operating suite on time. In the past, a JAN consultant suggested providing a Timex data link watch programmed with reminders of the employee's surgery times and other appointments. A new approach that incorporates the use of wearable technology includes having alerts delivered through smartphones and smart watches. The employee could also have alerts delivered through a watch minder watch. Watches with alerts can be valuable assets to employees who have difficulty managing time. Let's look at a couple of examples. First, we have the watch minder. The watch minder is a sports watch with a rechargeable battery that provides messages to the wearer, reminding them of important tasks. You can choose from up to 65 pre-programmed messages or create your own customized memo. The device also allows the wearer to utilize up to 30 alarms per day. The WatchMinder also has training and reminder modes as well as a vibrating alert with a snooze repeat feature. And the current price of the WatchMinder 3 is 69 US dollars. Now let's take a look at the Time Timer watch. Time Timer products allow the user to see how much time has elapsed by using a color blocking system. This visual representation can help employees stay on track by making it easier to understand how much time has passed and how much is left for a particular task. This could be very useful for those who need to block off chunks of time to work on specific tasks or products. Next, let's take a look at fitness trackers. These devices have become incredibly popular to assist those who want to keep track of their physical activity, but they can also be utilized to manage productivity. Trackers with alerting devices can be used to set reminders for important tasks. Here are a few examples. The Fitbit Ionic allows users to track physical activity, breathing, and heart rate. In addition to these standard features, the watch can also connect with a smartphone to provide calendar reminders and push notifications from the wearer's apps. This could allow users to have a hands-free access to important reminders. The Fitbit Ionic currently retails for $249.95, which can be quite an investment if you're not sure how well a fitness tracker will work to meet your needs. If you want to test out the idea of a fitness tracker or are just looking for a cheaper alternative, the Tesla's fitness tracker has many of the same features as the Fitbit Ionic for about $30. This option may also be beneficial for employees who work in rough env environments where expensive equipment could be easily damaged. No, no joke. I've seen it run over by a car and continue to work. <laughs> Teresa, you better watch where you're going. <laughs> what you're doing. Well, I didn't drop it. <laughs> That's impressive, though. I was very surprised that it continued to function. <laughs> it's amazing. Next, we have the Invisible Clock 2, which is a wearable timer that features 12 alarms, four timing features, a meeting timer, and a custom timer. The user can be alerted through a vibration customized for their needs. The invisible clock comes with a battery and a belt clip and can be purchased in nine colors. This product also comes with a one-year guarantee, so if you aren't sure the device will meet your needs, you can try it without much risk. The cost of the invisible clock, too, is $39.95. Hmm. You know, I've known people to wear it in a wrist wallet as well. Hmm. So like that could definitely work. Yeah. If you're not using a belt. Right. It's, it's um, something that can be worn on a wrist wallet, although it's kind of a tight fit. Mm -hmm. huh. Many employees find themselves working in an environment full of distractions. It's very common for workplaces to utilize cubicle seating, which can be very problematic for those who have difficulty concentrating due to a disability or medical condition. 
One suggestion we often make for employees in this situation is the use of noise-canceling earbuds or headphones. So here are a few examples of such technology. First, we have the Quiet On Buds. These are noise-canceling earbuds effective up to 40 decibels with low frequencies. They're wireless and can last 50 hours on a single charge. Bose also has a set of wireless earbuds that may help employees to cut out distraction. Their SoundSport earbuds have no cords and are designed to withstand sweat and inclement weather. Now these buds don't have active noise cancellation, but they may work well for someone who's able to listen to music or use a sound machine in their work environment. All right, let's look at a case example. An accountant with narcolepsy had difficulty staying awake during the workday. He often fell asleep unexpectedly at his desk. The company had a policy about sleeping in the workplace. Well, I think that's pretty common in most workplaces. Uh, so this opened up the employee to possible disciplinary action. Now, if you do have a similar situation, there is guidance on applying performance and conduct standards to employees with disabilities, but we're going to talk about a tech-related solution. So uh, one thing to keep in mind in situations like these, an employer can still hold an employee with a disability to the same performance and conduct standards as other employees, but they may need to provide reasonable accommodation and help the employee meet that standard if they are struggling to do so because of a disability. Well, who knew? You don't have to let everybody sleep all day. Right. Although, you know, when I worked in Japan, they had a nap room. I think we could implement that here. Right. <laughs> Too noisy here. <laughs> oh, you're probably right about that. We need the quiet on. <laughs> yeah. Well, so uh, in, in the past, a very common approach was to provide a flexible start time that would allow an employee to begin their shift later if they were having difficulty, you know, getting enough sleep at night, being alert enough during the day. But with narcolepsy, you can't always predict when it is that you're going to drop off. Sometimes it can be stress-related, for instance, and, and a little bit unpredictable. So a, a little bit of a newer approach, and one that we've talked about in the past, is providing a device called a doze alert. Now, the doze alert is designed to detect head movements, uh, the type of head movements that you would have when you are nodding off to sleep. Now, the good thing about the doze alert is also the bad thing about the doze alert. It's designed to detect when your head is starting to drop forward, as many of us do when we are starting to fall asleep. But if you fall asleep with your head tipped back or you just get very quiet and still, this probably is not the solution for you. So let's talk about a couple of other options. Okay, so for sleep detection, there are a few options. Uh, one that we've just talked about with the Doze Alert runs about $50, depending on where you pick it up. Uh, but the Nozzer Watch is really, really interesting. It doesn't detect when you've fallen asleep, but it has that ability to kind of uh, monitor you and notice when you might be slipping into a little bit of a sleepy state and wake you up from that sleepy state. Uh, and it works by increasing neural activity in the brain. Uh, by affecting the tactile nerve endings, which basically means it makes you uh, makes you feel something uh, when you are about to fall asleep. But you can use it with gloves and other protective clothing. It kind of kind of buzzes a little bit, but not in like a painful way. Is how I understand it. Uh, it's pretty cool. It's got a built-in clock, a timer, stopwatch, alarm clock, uh, and you can charge it wirelessly. And you get all this for the low low price of one hundred twelve dollars. Used to be seventy nine. It's gone up a little bit. Now, the stop sleep is a little bit different. Uh, you wear it on your fingers, and it measures the conductivity of your skin. Uh, because it turns out how conductive your skin is at any point in time can reflect what's going on in your brain and how sleepy you might be getting. So what they say is when you're falling asleep, you'll have a signal decrease when it comes to the conductivity of your skin. So that's what happens when you start to get drowsy. Now, this will alert you with a sound or a vibration when that's happening, when your skin is, is experiencing that change in conductivity. Uh, and this uh, is a little harder to find than it used to be, but you can still get it on Amazon for $189. So really interesting uh, newer products for detecting when someone is beginning to fall asleep. Now, I do want to say about these, they're for sleep. They're not for detecting like a hypoglycemic episode. For that, you want something else. They're not for detecting seizures either, but here's some things that are. 
So in the past when we've talked about uh, the smart monitor uh, and, and uh, the embrace and other things in this category, a lot of them have been like actual freestanding watches that you would wear. But we've seen a little bit of a shift. The Embrace watch, which is pictured here, is still like its own product that you wear on the wrist. You don't uh, sync it with like your Apple Watch or anything like that. It's its own standalone thing. But the others have kind of morphed. So you may still be seeing employees that are using the older watch style, uh, say of the Smart Monitor smartwatch, but you might also have somebody who's using the app-based version. Uh, so the Instant smartwatch detects abnormal movement and gives you a text or a phone call alert to a designated contact. So that could be a family member or a caregiver. And it continuously monitors the wear and detects repetitive shaking motion like you might have when you were experiencing a seizure. So it lets you to quickly uh, get help and also records the time, the date, the location, uh, and the severity of what the watch detected. And then that data can be reviewed by a clinician. It's a really interesting product. Uh, now, the Embrace is kind of similar. It records physiological signals uh, from sensors that are in the watch. And that's probably why it hasn't switched over to be a smartwatch related app. Uh, it's got its own sensor technology from what I can understand. But you can pair it with like a smartphone via Bluetooth. And what it really does is measures your sympathetic nervous system activity. So whereas the instant smartwatch detects more motion, this is uh, more focused on those physiological uh, signals that uh, let you know what's going on with your nervous system. But it's got a gyroscope, so it can detect motion as well. So this is one of those products where you pay one fee to get the product, and then there's a monitoring fee that you would pay monthly. Uh, so they're on version two of the Embrace Watch now, which runs 249, and it's just under 10 bucks a month for that monitoring service. Now the BioAlert, um, I, I went back and forth a little bit about whether or not to include it, but you may still have current users, so that's why we mention it here. Uh, but um, it's a little hard to get information on it. We haven't had new feedback on it in a while. But it's just another solution uh, for monitoring. And it's a little bit more pricey in terms of its plan. It's, it advertises $20 a month for a basic monitoring plan. Now, the, uh, the Instant Smartwatch, they have plans that range from 50 down to 15, depending on how often you think you might need to use it. So price point can be very sensitive. I don't see this necessarily as being something an employer would typically buy, but it might be something that a person wants to use to monitor their seizure activity wherever they are, including in the workplace. So I think this is probably usually going to be a personal use item that an employer might modify their policies to allow. What do you think, Britt? I agree. It's probably going to fall more under that personal use side of things. Yeah, and next we want to talk about uh, some other products that, again, might be used to monitor someone's health at work, uh, or the neck-worn air cleaners are actually used to modify the work environment. So first I want to talk about uh, Propeller Health. And this is another one of these two-part systems that involves a thing that you buy uh, and then an app that you can use for monitoring. You know, we're getting a lot of calls about allergies and asthma. Uh, we're running into ragweed season now, so I think we're going to get more and more calls about this. That's why we want to bring this to you today. But the Propeller Health System has a sensor that you actually attach to your inhaler if you're a person who uses an inhaler. And it syncs with an app that you would use um, on your phone, perhaps on your smartwatch. And what that app does is it takes note whenever you use your inhaler so that you can have a record of what's triggering your symptoms and causing you to need to use that inhaler. They actually have different versions for asthma and for COPD, which I thought was really fascinating. But you basically get personalized feedback on when you need to use your inhaler, which might be valuable if you need to go to your employer and say, hey, my triggers are getting symptoms are getting uh, more common at work, uh, and I can prove it. This is when I'm having to use my inhaler. 
It could also be useful for conversations with a doctor. Something else that's really interesting is the Viatom wearable oxygen monitor. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you have seen um, things that monitor your uh, oxygen levels in your blood. They shine like a little light through your finger. You might wear one when, when you're in the hospital, but there are portable models available. Usually they're not too expensive, maybe running around between $20 and $50, but that's just for like basically an instant read. You put it on your finger, you take the reading, you take it off. What's interesting about the Viatom is it's got this little ring that you put your finger through. It's kind of a soft ring, so it's not too uncomfortable to wear. And you can wear it for longer periods. Uh, and then again, uh, it works with an app to monitor your levels. So it's a little bit more expensive than a standard pulse ox uh, unit that you might get for portability. It runs about 119. Teresa, what's the distance on that between the app and the person who's wearing it? Like, could I put that on my mom? You wouldn't want to have the app with you and have it on your mom, I wouldn't think, because I think it runs on Bluetooth. So if we were in the same environment? If you were in the house together, yeah. Right. Yeah. But, you know, it's going to come out of sync at the distance Bluetooth comes out of sync is my understanding. But I'd be happy just to double like check a, it. Just like a Bluetooth, though, Bluetooth connection. I believe so. But I could look it up for you. Interesting. Okay. One thing that is nice about it, uh, and this is how people are using it, um, say, at home, is it will give you a little bit of an alert if your O2 level drops. That's what that baby sock does. Yeah. I forget which sock you're talking about, but I remember a sock that does this. Yeah. There's a baby sock that has an app. That's right. That's right. Um, and, but, you know, I think you'd run into the same problems that people run into with the sock, which is if it falls out of sync, you're going to get a panic. Right. And and you don't need that. Yeah. There's a whole bunch of sensors for babies to, to monitor their respiration. Uh, what this does is instead of counting respiration, uh, is it actually monitors your, your O2 level in your blood, which is how I understand it. I think that's what the Owlet does. It's called that's the Owlet the, Baby Care Baby That's the monitor. name of it. It's the Owlet. It's those tiny little socks. I am the office baby expert. <laughs> I wonder if you can put the socks on a thumb. That would be interesting. Hmm. That's a good question. But there's yeah. a lot more questions with these. Well, you know, there's always going to be questions with wearables. In fact, sometimes we question whether they're still going to be on the market by the time we get to the presentation. Yeah. <laughs> it's just good a point. It just comes and goes all the time. What I'm thinking with this Viatom, I think it would be uncomfortable to wear, you know, like for more than, say, 10, 15 minutes at a time. Okay. E even though it's soft and it's got a ring, uh, it's kind of okay. big. It looks like it might interfere with other activities. But maybe when you were resting, okay. it might be really good. Uh, so a lot of people use a lot of things, though, to get along at work. Um, due to their respiratory health. A lot of people are using portable oxygen, maybe even portable oxygen concentrators, uh, just to maintain their health while they're at work. One question that we get a lot is, is it safe for someone to use oxygen at work? And I think it really depends on the setting and what the person's doing. I've only had a couple of calls where I really had a really strong concern about a person using oxygen. Uh, one was an inspector in a munitions factory, though, so I think it makes sense that I would be concerned. Mechanic. Electrician working with arcing electricity. Yeah. Yeah. But in most office settings, there's not really a problem. People sometimes wonder, well, will it be a trip hazard? But there's things you can do to adjust that. But uh, on this slide, I want to talk just for a second about neck-worn air cleaners. Because we've seen a lot on the market, and you see new ones come and go every spring as we get to the beginning of pollen season. And the honest truth is we get mixed feedback on them. Some of them we get decent feedback on, like the ones from the wine company, W-E-I-N. Uh, people say those work pretty well, but their battery life is terrible. Uh, with some of the other brands, they say, well, the battery life is good, but I can't really tell if it's doing anything. The main thing that... Uh, I feel concerned about with these is some of them do release minute amounts of ozone just as a function of how they work. So I think it's really critical to get a medical professional's input to see if something is appropriate for the person or not. If somebody has asthma but ozone is a trigger for their asthma symptoms, you don't want them wearing something that emits their trigger. 
I would also say for these, they're definitely best as a part of a larger accommodation plan. They're probably not going to be something that you want to provide as the sole accommodation. They might be helpful for a situation where someone has to go to a restroom or a common area where there might be irritants, but that might not be the only accommodation that that person needs, but rather just one tool in the toolbox. Well, you hit the nail on the head, Brittany, for sure, because these things aren't designed to be worn all day, every day, even if they work as well as the advertising says they work. They're, they're just not designed for that. Uh, it's more like to get a person through a situation where they might have to go through a space that they're unsure of or that uh, maybe there are members of the public that, that cannot be avoided in this space, like someone who has to come up to the reception desk occasionally uh, where there might be members of the public wearing, say, a perfume. Uh, it's, it's not... It's not a be-all, end-all solution like people want it to be. You've got to do things to adjust the environment and the tasks. And I think that's true for uh, any of the things that people are using for medical management. These are just little pieces of the puzzle. We don't really have any data, do we, on whether Medicare, Medicaid, or other insurances cover these devices? The ones on this page, no. Now, the cardiac monitors, uh, we're starting to see a Medicare coverage for those. Okay. So we're going to get to those in in a little bit. Okay. And I've found when I have researched some of these products, it's a frequently asked question on many of their websites. So check the individual products website for more information on that. Yeah. One thing I found that does irritate me a little is I understand the companies don't want to share the sticker price if there might be other funding available. But some of these places won't even share pricing information unless you get on their mailing list first. And that's, that's not my favorite tactic. But on the other hand, uh, a sticker price might look high, uh, but perhaps people aren't paying the retail for that. They might get assistance. I want to talk a little bit about uh, diabetes management in the workplace. And, of course, when it comes to diabetes, probably the most common accommodation that we talk about, that we hear about, that people are requesting is a modified schedule, something that's going to let them check their levels, check their sugar, uh, take medication if they need it, stop to eat if they need it. It's, it's just an incredibly common accommodation request. But sometimes you might need something a little extra, and that's what these products are about. Again, they're not uh, a be-all, end-all solution for diabetes in the workplace. These are just tools that people might choose to use or might request. So one that we're uh, getting more and more questions on is um, things like the Dexcom, continuous glucose monitoring systems. So these are, are things that a person would wear attached to their body, um, perhaps uh, on the forearm, for instance. It, it might not be hidden. You might be able to see it. And they are usually connected wirelessly, either to like a smartphone app or another type of a monitor. And uh, just for people that don't have a smartphone, there are other options. But they're almost all connected wirelessly, and the point is to continuously monitor your glucose levels and see if you're getting too high or too low and send you an alert. People who need these really need them. Uh, they're often what we call brittle diabetics, uh, people whose blood sugar goes up and down just incredibly quickly or unpredictably. And this lets them stay healthy and manage their A1C and everything that they need to do for their doctor. As, as an alternative to testing like every 30 minutes. But we have uh, recently, just since the beginning of this year, started getting questions from employers who want to ban wireless devices from the workplace, including these things that are very necessary for medical monitoring. Uh, and some employers will budge on it and some won't. But uh, if you have someone who says they're using a Dexcom, uh, it's for diabetes, it's to monitor glucose. It's usually very important that they have it. And while there might be alternative approaches they could use, I think it's between the person and their doctor what's the best choice for them. I'll get off my soapbox now. Um, the other thing I want to talk about is the Thrive Glucose Gel Necklace. This is so popular that it's actually sold out right now. Um, the little blue circle is a diabetes awareness signal. And you can see the necklace is a little bit thick if you're looking at the slides. That's because it's a tube filled with glucose gel. 
And the idea is that uh, you would wear this uh, around your neck and have it available almost instantaneously if you realize you're having a hypoglycemic reaction. You don't have to fiddle around with glucose tablets or look for something else to eat, find candy. Um, some people have been instructed by their doctor to do things like squirt uh, cake icing into their mouth. This is more streamlined. It was actually designed by a guy who's a cyclist and needed something that he could get really quickly uh, if he realized he was having a hypoglycemic reaction while he was out uh, enjoying his sport. So it's really interesting. It has kind of a funny look. You might modify a dress code uh, to allow it in a workplace. I don't know if everybody's going to love the the symbol or not either, but it must be popular because you can't even get it right now. It's sold out. Hmm. Um, siren socks. That's the last thing I want to talk about on this slide today. Um, the siren socks are actually a kind of smart sock. I never thought I'd see the day, but we have smart socks now. And what they do is actually monitor your feet, which can be very important if you're a person with diabetes, for signs that your circulation might not be where it needs to be or that you may have a sore that needs attention. Uh, because, you know, as, uh, as you get older, you may be more susceptible to both diabetes and things that make it hard to, like, see the bottom of your own feet. And this is something that would allow a person to uh, independently be aware of that and know that they need to go and, and see their doctor about a foot problem. Uh, and like most things these days, it works with an app and there's a subscription model. Now, you used to be able to just buy this, like go to the company's website and order up yourself uh, a set and a subscription. But I think they're, that they're wanting a prescription now uh, is, is the information that I've got. So I think... Maybe some people were buying it and not finding it suitable for them. How does it signal, Teresa? It's like everything else. It connects to the phone. Okay. Uh, and just lets you know that it, it uses heat sensing uh, to, to see what the health of your feet is like. Okay. To kind of let you know if you're developing a hot spot or a sore. All right. So there's some fascinating new products coming to market for sure. There's a couple more here that I want to talk about. And again, some of these products are a little bit in development. So uh, the information, for instance, on the iBeat has actually changed since we finalized our slides, between the time we finalized the slides and the time I finalized my uh, script for today. So the, the iBeat is now known as the 100 plus, And I'm assuming that's because they want us all to live to be 100 plus. It has some similarities to fall detectors that have been around for a long time uh, in that it can detect uh, if you're having an issue and give you a way to call for help. Uh, but instead of being worn around the neck, it's worn on your wrist, and it actually uh, does cardiac monitoring to let you know if, if your heart may be beating in an unusual way that perhaps needs attention. Uh, and if you're looking at the slide, uh, the watch face is saying, are you okay? And there's a green button for yes and a red button for no, um, so that if there's you know a false positive or something, uh, you can let the watch know that you're okay. Like a lot of these other things, uh, it can share information with a doctor or with someone who's like a trusted friend or family member uh, when you need emergency help. But they recently changed the iBeat company, is still iBeat, uh, but the watch has been rebranded as the 100 plus. And this is a little different from the Cardea Solo. The Cardea Solo uh, is something that might be a little less obvious and might be suited to someone who wants to wear, say, um, a smartwatch for another reason. Because it's, um, it's like a sensor that you wear. And then it sends information to your doctor uh, to let them know that you've had an arrhythmia or something that needs attention. So two very similar products, but worn in different ways. And I think a lot of people want a product that will do everything. But sometimes it might make sense to go with a standalone, especially if you need a smartwatch for another reason, like information access. Cardia also has a product called the 2020, which is used to detect heart problems. But unlike the Solo, it's not necessarily something that needs to be for just one person. I've seen them market it for things like sports teams 
um, so that you know if somebody um, is having an issue, perhaps has collapsed at a sports practice, it can be used right away. Um, whereas the iBeat uh, 100 Plus watch and the Cardia Solar are designed for single users. Now, like I was saying, Beth, um, the Cardia doesn't tell you how much it is on their website. At least I couldn't find it easily. Hmm. But it did have a place in its FAQ where they talked about what are the possible funding sources. Okay. And the iBeat, uh, its pricing is similar to other smartwatches, but again, there's a monthly monitoring fee. Uh, but they recently sent out an email that uh, you can get Medicare coverage for it. Okay. And uh, not that we endorse or recommend products here because we don't, but I called people when that email came out. All right. Makes sense. Anyway, that's like a summary of some of the medical management products that we're seeing today. Again, this is an emerging category. Lots of changes happening every other week in this category. Well, Brittany wants to talk about us about uh, wants to talk to us about one of her favorite cases. I think. Now we're going to take a look at assistive technology options and accommodations for information access. Employees with low vision or blindness often need to access various types of information that's typically presented visually. Employees who are deaf or hard of hearing may also need accommodations to gain access to information in the work environment. So in this section, we're going to explore different methods of presenting information in order to make it accessible for those with various disabilities. As Teresa said, this is an example from when I first started as a JAN consultant, and it's one of my favorites. A barista was struggling to read product labels due to progressive vision loss. He was also struggling to find the stacks of clear drink cups. In the past, a typical accommodation for this type of issue could be to provide the employee with an ID Mate talking barcode scanner. This could allow him to have the product information read aloud to him in a synthetic voice. But a newer approach that utilizes wearable assistive technology could be to program an OrCam MyEye to recognize products sold in the coffee shop. We're going to talk a little bit more about this device in just a moment. So here we have a few accommodation ideas and wearables for identification. The OrCam MyEye is a wearable device with optical character recognition that claims to be capable of reading information from a computer screen in addition to paper documents. The OrCam attaches to the wearer's glasses and functions by taking a picture of printed text in the viewer's line of sight. It then reads the text in a synthetic voice. It can also be programmed to identify objects and faces. Now this particular model is about $3,500. Another option that we have is IRA. This is a system that connects users to a virtual sighted assistant who can describe the user's settings by utilizing either a cell phone camera or a camera within a pair of IRA smart glasses. Now, this product is available through a monthly subscription plan, and that starts at $29 a month for 30 minutes of service. Now, another really cool product that we became aware of recently at a conference is called WayAround. WayAround is a tag and scan system that allows users to add identification tags called Way Tags to everyday items like clothing or office supplies. The user can then scan these tags to get a readout of what the item is. The tags can come in the form of stickers, buttons, magnets, and clips. And the cost of the way tags will vary by the type and number. And one last product for this section is the Oxy ISO color blindness correction glasses, which were designed to help individuals who have color vision deficiencies by enhancing retinal color perception. And this can be really useful in situations where color differentiation is crucial, such as by EMTs and electricians. This can be purchased for about $277. And now, one more product I'd like to talk about here is the BrainPort Vision Pro, which is a really interesting device that translates digital information from a wearable video camera into electrical stimulation patterns on the surface of the tongue. So users are trained to interpret these patterns as shapes or objects in their environment. 
And some people have described this as essentially being able to see with your tongue. So this is a really innovative way to access information. And now we're going to move on to a few devices that can assist with navigation. Wayband is a watch designed to enhance the autonomy of wearers with blindness or low vision by providing haptic feedback for navigation. The Wayband uses a virtual corridor to guide its wearers through a series of vibrations that occur when the wearer steps outside of the corridor. So essentially, if you're walking in the right direction based on the place you're trying to get to, nothing's going to happen. But if you start to go in the wrong direction, this device is going to give you a set of vibrations to say that you need to move back into that corridor. Another product here we have is the Lachal insoles, which can be worn inside the shoes and provide haptic feedback that tells the wearer what direction their destination is in. This is a really neat concept, and similar to the Wayband, you want to make sure that if you're using this kind of thing, you're utilizing it in conjunction with orientation and mobility skills and related products to avoid accidents. So you don't necessarily want to just go out relying purely on these. You want to be using other mobility devices and things like that if you have them and are able to use them, but they can really be a helpful part of that plan. Another device is the Buzz Clip, which is a small and discreet wearable for people that are blind or partially sighted. The device uses ultrasound to detect obstacles that may lie directly in one's path. It then notifies the user of these obstacles through vibrations, allowing the user to safely navigate around any objects they may encounter. The Buzz Clip offers head level obstacle detection, which may be lacking from canes or service animals alone. Now, we're going to explore communication wearables, starting with assistive listening devices. Assistive listening devices, or ALDs, provide a certain degree of amplification to the wearer and can help to reduce problems associated with background noise. By sending the sound signal directly to the individual's ears through a headset, earbud, hearing aid, etc., an ALD can help an individual to hear and understand important sounds through enhanced clarity and amplification. And coming up, we have a few of Teresa's favorite products to talk about, so I'm going to let her jump in here. Well, you know I would anyway. <laughs> Um, but uh, when you're working with someone who needs an assistive listening device and they have a hearing aid or are thinking about getting a hearing aid, it can be really crucial to work with an audiologist because not all of these things are interchangeable. One thing to look for is whether or not a hearing aid has a telecoil. Um, if it does, then they may be able to use something that has a telecoil-enabled headset or that has a neck loop. Uh, whereas if somebody is using... Um, a hearing aid that has a lot of proprietary products, it won't do you any good to get, say, an Oticon product, product to use with, say, a Phonak hearing aid. It's incredibly important to know the type of hearing aid that the person is using to know what your options are. And, and this is for the people who use the Bluetooth-enabled features on their hearing aids. These features are also available for cochlear implant users. Pictured, we have the Mini Mic 2. Uh, and a TV streamer, both from the Cochlear company, as well as the Cochlear phone clip, which is designed to give someone who uses the Cochlear brand, Cochlear implants, access to, say, a cellular phone. Also pictured, we have the Safe and Clear Surgical Face Mask, and this is an exciting option for those who benefit from lip reading uh, but need to work in a medical environment. You can see there's a little clear window where you can see the wearer's mouth. And uh, those are $40 a box from Amazon. I looked up a bunch of prices before the show. <laughs> In addition to those products, another thing that can be helpful for communication is communication bracelets. These are essentially low-tech, augmentative, and alternative communication devices that have certain phrases or symbols that the wearer can point to to express fairly simple ideas and phrases to anyone who's around them. So if someone has limited speech or limited ability to use their voice, sometimes they can use something like this and just quickly point to get their idea across.
All right, let's talk about another example. A human resource assistant in the benefits department was having difficulty concentrating due to anxiety and high stress. So in, in the past, some typical non-techie ways to approach this uh, have included modified break schedules, flexibility to call a support person, um, strategies maybe to stay organized, maybe things like color coding, having a mentor. And a lot of people do still benefit from noise cancellation, headphones, and using white noise. Um, some people, rather than white noise, do better with various types of music, especially instrumental music. It kind of depends on the person. But there are some new approaches. So one is to allow a person flexibility to use an app, um, either for deep breathing or for meditation. Some of these are syncable to one of your smartwatches. Some people wear products to monitor their stress. Some of these can send an alert to you if you're uh, exhibiting a behavior that is associated with stress, like um, breathing quickly, for instance, or breathing shallowly. You can also use an app or a smartwatch to set reminders uh, to yourself to check in and see how well you're focusing. So let's look at some of the options in this category. <laughs> Teresa, let's fix your headset here. We're having technical difficulties here in the JN webcast room. How's that? I don't know, Beth. This headset's just weird. <laughs> <laughs> I think we got it. I, I need to use one of these apps to deal with my stress from this headset. <laughs> so, for example, there's the Breathe Well app, uh, and that assists the user in performing deep, slow, diaphragmatic breathing. Uh, and it gives you a little bit of um, visual and auditory guidance, some cues, if you will, to help pace your breathing. And you can also use it to check your heart rate. So for someone who needs to take a break to check in with themselves and calm down a little, this can be very helpful. Uh, another product that's kind of similar is the Spire Health Tag. So the Spire actually started off as something that you would like clip onto your clothing, uh, but people had an issue with forgetting to unclip it and putting it through the washing machine. Uh, thus, the Spire Health Tag was worn, which is unique in that it can be washed and dried uh, without, you know, completely falling apart. Uh, the downside is uh, you might have to buy like a set of them, and I believe it's like three ninety nine for a pack of eight, like not three dollars and ninety nine cents, three hundred and ninety nine dollars for a pack of eight of these guys. Um, but it can send information for your doctor, help you monitor your stress, et cetera. Um, the Think is a product that um, we kind of struggle with whether or not to include because it's been through a couple of iterations. You may have people who are using any of these three iterations in the workplace. The original Think, um, they were kind of cagey on exactly how it works. But it, it's something that you wore kind of near on your head, and it was supposed to help you relax. People described themselves as maybe feeling kind of buzzed when they used it. But the second iteration was more like a TENS unit that we'd use on your neck, like a neck massager, like a fancy multi-hundred dollar neck massager. But now the company is focusing on their product as a solution for psoriasis. Oh. Yeah. Which one is this? The T-H-Y-N-C, the think. Huh. Yeah. I thought that was the one you were talking about. Yeah. Uh, so, like, the original one uh, seems seems to do something related to brain waves, but I've never been able to clear, get a clear answer on exactly what it does. It would trade secret. But I'm not sure I want to put something on my head that's affecting my brain waves without telling me how, <laughs> right? Uh, I kind of wanted to buy the one that's like a TENS unit. I was like, neck massage, yes, please. Uh, but now they're focusing on psoriasis solutions. So it's been an interesting evolution for this company. That's confusing to me. It's confusing to me, too. That's why we include it in this presentation, so that people will be hopefully less confused. Huh. <laughs> uh, is it for psoriasis? Is it not? I don't know. Maybe soon. But uh, I think the most promising one in this category is probably the health tag. Uh, but it's, it's something that, you know, it looks a little weird. If you, if you happen to notice that it's fallen off someone's clothing, you might wonder what the heck it is. Uh, let's talk about habit monitoring. 
So there are a number of products available now to help you monitor your habits and stay on task. The Keen is something kind of unique. It monitors how your hand is moving uh, on the arm that you're wearing it uh, to see if you might be pulling your hair, biting your nails, uh, something of that nature, and it will send you a vibration when your hand is in position to do the thing that you want to remember not to do, and then you'll hopefully learn not to do it. Uh, for kids, it's being used to limit thumb sucking, uh, but a lot of people are using it for trichotillomania, pulling your hair out, uh, for nail biting, that kind of thing. I don't know how it feels about this one either. <laughs> I think it depends on the person and how much you want to get rid of the habit. <laughs> you know, I think the main problem is not enough of us have doors anymore. We can't, like, be ourselves behind a door. Right. But that's a pro problem for another day. Now, the Revive is really interesting. Um, it's just a little band with a piece that vibrates. And the original version, you just set these re these vibration reminders. And the idea is uh, someone with ADHD would feel uh, the buzz on their wrist and be alerted to check in and make sure they were on task. But they've kind of fancified it, if you will. Uh, it still is only about $149, but you can actually create reminders that will display on the watch itself. So the newer version actually has a little screen. It's very similar to the watch minder in that respect. Now, Brittany wants to say a few words about wearable device policies. So if you've been listening to this webcast and you're thinking, these are personal use items, I don't have to provide this to an employee because it sounds like something they're using in their personal life and just bringing into the office. I hope this section will clear that up a little bit. So mobile devices like tablets, cell phones, smartphones, smartwatches, and other wearable devices can be valuable productivity tools when used appropriately. And they can also help employees maintain a work-life balance, use concentration and relaxation techniques, manage health conditions, a lot of really valuable things. But they can also serve as a distraction or worse, pose a security risk. As a result, many employers are developing and updating policies on the use of personal devices and governing what types of devices and apps can be purchased for employees. So in what ways might the use of wearables impact an employer's practices and procedures? I want to note that in talking about these devices, we're not necessarily saying that the employer has an obligation to purchase some of them because they absolutely do fall into that personal use side for some things. With that being said, a lot of these things come with apps. A lot of these things come with devices that might look unusual to the employer. And so we want you to be aware of them so that if you see something like the Dexcom or someone is using an app to manage their health, that you don't automatically shut that down, but rather understand this is a time to talk about reasonable accommodation. And Brittany, that reasonable accommodation may very well just be the policy modification. Exactly. Right? Okay. Yeah, that might just be a matter of the employer allowing the person to bring the device. It might be modifying the policy to allow them to use something connected to wireless when employees typically don't have access to that. So this isn't always about purchasing. Okay. This can just be a matter of letting the person bring in something that might look a little bit weird. Got it. And you also want to keep in mind that policies must be applied in a non-discriminatory way. So if you have a policy forbidding certain devices, you don't want to just apply that to a person with a disability you see trying to do it. You want to make sure that you're applying it uniformly and that you're considering excusing people from that as an accommodation if needed. You might also need to consider whether this device is a personal use item or an accommodation. So employers are not typically required to provide items that are needed for daily activities of living both on and off the job. Some wearable devices might definitely be considered personal use items, meaning that you don't have an obligation to purchase them as an employer. With that being said, you might still need to consider allowing them to use them. You may also need to consider as an employee or employer being open to the idea of looking at other alternatives. In some situations, it might not be feasible to allow the use of certain devices. For example, some workplaces may have legitimate security requirements that don't allow the use of wireless-enabled devices. 
in these cases, the employees might need to be open to exploring alternatives. And ultimately, ways that wearables can be used in the workplace include managing time, stress, and medical conditions, accessing information needed at work, and meeting communication needs, just to name a few. So be on the lookout for accommodations for those sorts of things. And with our last little bit of time, we wanted to tell you about a few things that are experimental in beta testing or on the horizon. Um, so we it pictured we have the allergy amulet, which is something that is coming out this fall to be used to uh, test your food with your smartphone, and it's going to be available as a keychain or a necklace uh, that you would use to sample your food and then analyze it on your smartphone to see if it's going to kill you. Uh, we're starting to see some uh, some new research on tattoo-based monitoring of health conditions. So can I use this to tattoo my mom? And so uh, I can keep track of where she is. You personally? Like, yeah, I want to tattoo my mother, yes. She's 87 and she doesn't listen. <laughs> so can I, tattoo her, can I tattoo her and, like, does it have a GPS? Not a yeah. GPS tattoo. Uh, it's designed to monitor health conditions. I don't want that. <laughs> well, you know, they are. we are seeing research, too, on tattoo-based uh, bioelectric interfaces. All I want is to tattoo her so she can't remove it and to be able to monitor what she's doing when she's doing it. Yeah, that's, that's a real problem because, you know, we have a lot of things that are GPS trackers that are designed for kids and elders, but there's very few of them that you can't remove. Maybe we will come to uh, tattoos one day. I'll let you know if I see one. That's what she needs. <laughs> if I see one, I promise I will tell you because I'll be getting some for uh, my house, too. <laughs> <laughs> lines um, as far as bioelectric interfaces. Uh, we're also seeing exciting new developments in brain computer interfaces. One example are uh, EEG headsets, uh, and these are used with software to help control, say, a computer, so a person can type using their brain waves, if you will. And this is actually already being used on an experimental basis by people with ALS. And then uh, there's a few things for vision, too, that Brittany is able to geek out on very well. <laughs> So a few things that I've seen in conferences that I wanted to talk about. First is the Retisa by QD Laser. These are wearable glasses that project images directly onto the retina. And it's making its rounds in U.S. trade shows, but unfortunately right now it's only available in Japan. So I got to test it out, but you might not be able to purchase it here for a while. Another really interesting thing is the Orion by Second Sight. So this is a follow-up to their product, the Argus 2, which is an implant and wearable that provides artificial vision via light perception. And the Argus was only designed to assist people who lost their vision through retinitis pigmentosa, whereas the Orion can help anyone who has at some point had the ability to see. So it's not limited to just that one type of vision loss. So those are some really interesting things we're seeing in development on the vision side. Yeah, they're kind of like cochlear implants, but for vision. Mm -hmm. So exciting. All right. When you two get a tattoo for my 87-year-old mother and I can monitor her, we will have another webcast. <laughs> in the meantime, that's all the time we have. If you need additional information or you want to discuss an accommodation or ADA issue, please feel free to contact us. We do really appreciate and thank you for attending, and thank you also to Alternative Communication Services for providing the net captioning. We hope the program was useful. As mentioned earlier, an evaluation form will automatically pop up on your screen in another window as soon as we're finished. We appreciate your feedback, so we hope you'll take a minute to complete the form. Thank you, Teresa and Brittany. This concludes today's webinar.